the celestial empire or points and beginnings of information about china and the chinese by george mogridge chapter 15 imperial proclamation there are not many things in the chinese collection that give me more pleasure than the porcelain the beautiful flower pots and garden seats the elegant ornaments and images and the splendid bowls jars and vases which are profusely grouped together never fail to call up in my mind scenes of eastern magnificence they lead me step by step through the mansions of the mandarins and the palace of the emperor till i see tao kuang himself on his imperial throne though i have given you the ceremonies observed on the accession of tao kuang's mounting the throne at full length yet is there another document that i wish to lay before you it is the hei chao or joyful proclamation of the emperor on his receiving from heaven and revolving nature the government of the world there is so much seeming moderation justice and charity in the edicts and proclamations of the celestial government that if we had not some knowledge of the past to guide us we might be led to suppose that chinese emperors ought as a matter of right to rank as the most virtuous specimens of humanity the following is the joyful proclamation to which i have alluded our ta sing dynasty has received the most substantial indications of heaven's kind care our ancestors te tsu and te tsung began to lay the vast foundation of our empire and shi tsu became the sole monarch of china our sacred ancestor kang he the emperor yung ching the glory of his age and qin lung the eminent in honor all abounded in virtue were divine in martial prowess consolidated the glory of the empire and molded the whole to peaceful harmony his late majesty who has now gone the great journey governed all under heaven's canopy 25 years exercising the utmost caution and industry nor evening nor morning was he ever idle he assiduously aimed at the best possible rule and hence his government was excellent and illustrious the court and the country felt the deepest reverence and the stillness of profound awe the benevolent heart and the benevolent administration were universally diffused in china proper as well as beyond it order and tranquility prevailed and the tens of thousands of common people were all happy but in the midst of a hope that this glorious reign would be long protracted and the help of heaven would be received many days unexpectedly on descending to bless by his majesty's presence luan yang the dragon charioteer the holy emperor became a guest on high my sacred and indulgent father had in the year that he began to rule alone silently settled that the divine utensil the throne should devolve on my contemptible person i knowing the feebleness of my virtue at first felt much afraid i should not be competent to the office but on reflecting that the sages my ancestors have left to posterity their plans that his late majesty has laid the duty on me and heaven's throne should not be long vacant i have done violence to my feelings and forced myself to intermit a while my heartfelt grief that i may with reverence obey the unalterable decree and on the 27th of the 8th moon i purposed devoutly to announce the event to heaven to earth to my ancestors and to the gods of the land and of the grain 
and shall then sit down on the imperial throne. Let the next year be the first of Tao Kuang, Reason's glory. I look upwards and hope to be able to continue former excellences. I lay my hand on my heart with feelings of respect and cautious awe. When a new monarch addresses himself to the empire, he ought to confer benefits on his kindred and extensively bestow gracious favours. Whatever is proper to be done on this occasion is stated below. First, on all persons at court, and those also who are at a distance from it, having the title of Wang, King, and downwards, and those of or above the rank of a Kung, Duke, let gracious gifts be conferred. Second, on all the nobles below the rank of Kung, down to that of Ki, Ki, let gracious gifts be conferred. Third, whether at court or abroad in the provinces, Manchow and Chinese officers, great and small, civil and military, shall all be promoted one step. Fourth, those officers whose deceased parents have received posthumous titles of honour shall have those titles increased to correspond with the promotion of their sons. Fifth, officers at court of the fourth degree of rank and in the provinces, those of the third shall have the privilege of sending one son to the national college, Kuo Se Kin. Sixth, officers who have been deprived of their rank but retained in office and whose pay has been stopped or forfeited shall have their rank and pay restored. Seventh, let the number of candidates to be accepted at the literary examinations in each province be increased from 10 to 30 persons. Eighth, let the required time of residence in the Kuo Ze Kin College be diminished one month on this occasion. Ninth, let all the Kyu Jin graduates be permitted as a mark of honour to wear a button of the sixth degree of rank. Tenth, let officers be dispatched to sacrifice at the tombs of departed emperors and kings of every past dynasty, at the grave of Confucius, and at the five great mountains and the four great rivers of China. Eleventh, accepting rebels, murderers, and other unpardonable offenders, let all those who may have committed crimes before daybreak of the 27th of the 8th moon, the day of ascending the throne, be forgiven. If any person again accused them with the crimes already forgiven, punish the accuser according to the crime alleged. Twelve. All convicts in the several provinces who have been transported for crimes committed, but who have conducted themselves quietly for a given time, shall be permitted to return to their homes. Thirteenth. Tatars, under the different banners and persons of the imperial household convicted of the embezzlement of property and punished by forfeits, if it can be proved that they really possess no property, let them be all forgiven. Fourteenth, let all officers of government whose sons or grandsons were charged with fines or forfeits on account of their father's crimes be forgiven. Fifteenth, let officers and privates in the Tatar army to whom government may have advanced money not be required to repay it. Sixteenth, let all old soldiers of the Tatar and Chinese armies who have seen service and are now invalided have their cases examined into and have some favour conferred on them in addition to the legal compassion they already receive. Seventeenth, let there be an inquiry made in all the provinces for those families in which there are alive 
five generations and those who have seen seven generations and rewards be conferred in addition to the usual honorary tablet conferred by law. 18th. Agriculture is of the first importance to the empire. Let the officers of government everywhere and always laud those who are diligent in ploughing and sowing. 19th. Old men have, in every age, been treated with great respect. Let a report be made of all above seventy, both of Tatars and Chinese, with the exception of domestic slaves and people who already possess rank. Twentieth. Let one month's pay be given to certain of the Manchow and Mongku Tatar soldiers and also to the Chinese troops who joined the Tatar standard at the conquest. 21st. Let men who belonged to the Tatar army and who are now above 70 years of age have a man allowed to attend upon them and excuse them from all service. To those above 80 give a piece of silk, a catty of cotton, a ship measure of rice and ten catties of flesh meat and to those above 90 double these largesses. 22nd. Let all overseers of asylums for widows and orphans and sick people be always attentive and prevent anyone being destitute. Lo, now on succeeding to the throne I shall exercise myself to give repose to the millions of my people. Assist me to sustain the burden laid on my shoulders. With veneration I receive charge of heaven's great concerns. Ye kings and statesmen, great and small, civil and military, everyone be faithful and devoted and aid in supporting the vast affair that our family dominion may be preserved hundreds and tens of thousands of years in never-ending tranquility and glory. Promulgate this to all under heaven. Cause everyone to hear it. When we read of such a monarch as Kia King exercising the utmost caution, never being idle, assiduously aiming at the best possible rule, diffusing around him the influence of a benevolent heart and a benevolent administration, exciting the deepest reverence and rendering his people happy, we can hardly help exclaiming, What a divinity doth hedge a king! Truly, China is a strange country and the Chinese are a strange people, but never can I look over the map of the celestial empire without emotions of pleasure. It takes me back to days that are past, to sunshiny seasons and flowery scenes of enjoyment. In Kwa, when will thy arms again be folded across thy breast, while thou bendest low to receive me with respect? Chinkwa, when shall I drink of the fragrant herb beneath thy garden pagoda, beside the flowing stream and listen to thy recitals of far-off cities and mountains and rivers which I have not seen? Hangfra, shall we never again wander together through the tea plantations of Fokien? Ardent wert thou in thine harangues against opium, and excess in all its forms, and eloquent was thy tongue in praise of Bohia, Kongu, Sushong, and Peko, lauding temperance and the milder virtues. Though the mountain waves of ocean roll between us, we are not altogether divided. The past will rise to thy remembrance as it does to mine, and our hearts will yet beat in friendly unison. By thy countrymen I am styled a barbarian, and by mine thou art held in low estimation. Yet hast thou learned that a barbarian may have a heart, and I, that a disciple of Confucius, may possess kindly affections. <laughs>